Of course, I do not need to tell the people of Israel of nightmares, but I do not need to remind you that there is a people living alongside you who, like you, have experienced loss of lives, of families, homes, and whole communities, and who feel the same despair. Security through weapons cannot bring peace. Only a peace with justice can bring real security. But let me add, to negotiate, as we have all learned, you negotiate not with those you choose as partners, with, but with those with whom you are at war. You do not need the mediation of well-meaning friends. There are signs that even Washington is losing patience with us in the Middle East. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton recently proposed that the United States should attempt to pivot away, to pivot away from the Middle East toward the Asia Pacific region. And the justification for that is to develop the Silk Roads that all seem to lead from Iran to China. Speaking of the Sikha community of Central Asian countries on the one hand, and focusing on the circuit that once connected India, China with Turkey and Egypt, she argued in favor of a network of road, rail, and energy links that would traverse Central Asia. I don't know whether this is wish wishful thinking or leaping into the future, but I just wanted to say that if we have a serious wish to change enmity, if not immediately to friendship, at least to a recognition of shared interests, equal sovereignty, and a shared humanity, we need a vision, a concept. Negotiations are not viewed as a delaying strategy, whereby unpalatable solutions as a result of procrastination allow the continuation of policies which make those solutions difficult to achieve. Conditions do not exist today between Israelis and Palestinians or between Israel, Arab and Middle East states. But when the enemy is defined as permanent and the conflict unsolvable, negotiations are farcical and unfortunately that is the situation today. Prior to the outbreak of the Second Intifada, one-fourth of the Palestinian workforce traveled to Israel each day for work. That traffic has been reduced to a trickle. Today, Palestinians view Israel solely through the experience of occupation and diminishing livelihood, especially in the Gaza Strip. Please do not misunderstand me. I have often quoted Abba Iban in the context of his call for a Benelux, for three intra-independent entities living next to each other. But today, when a large majority of Israelis come to believe that peace with the Arabs is not possible, then the Palestinian and other Arab and Middle Eastern societies come to the conclusion that peace with Israel, even if it were possible, may not be desirable. I am afraid this is already happening among growing sections of Palestinian and Arab society for reasons that the President touched on earlier, the turn towards fundamentalist religious extremism, which is not limited to Muslims, but also extends to Jews and Christians as well. Many Israelis who would wish to live with Palestinians on terms of equal sovereignty and shared aspirations may be questioned in terms of their sagacity, may be treated as fools, while Palestinians and Arabs who still cling to the hope that peace is possible are cursed as traitors. Many of the Herzliya reports speak of a move to delegitimize Israel. Israel's existence and security is dependent on how it treats both those within and those surrounding its borders. Therefore, under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we hear a Palestinian spokesman, spokesman saying again and again, possibly too late, to discriminate against some minorities or to treat them as second-class citizens of the state or under international law to build settlements on occupied Palestinian lands is unlawful. One cannot complain of the soft war against Israel while the delegitimization of Palestine and all the Arab world continues more frantically than ever before. 
And as for the Arab revolt, I am a student of that Arab revolt, and I refer to the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. I refer to the Arab Renaissance movement, where at Versailles, Jews and Arabs, before the first shot was fired in anger, believed in a region of interdependent states and peoples. But today, I have not heard any reference in the Arab Spring to water. And how can there be spring without water? So I appeal to you in looking to a conference for security and cooperation in the Middle East, can we not take a, le a, a, a lesson from Monet and Schumann after two world wars? They established a coal and steel community. Can we not go into conversational mode? Can we not develop a conversazione? And I see the president of the World Bank, a man with thought and concept. Can we not look at this region as a region that can promote a water and energy community for the human environment, for the displaced, for the internally displaced, for the stateless, for the refugees, is it not time, whether our color is black or white or brown, that we started to look at our joint future? Iron wall strategies and iron wall mentalities on all sides reflect what Henry Kissinger once said. He addressed Israel in saying Israel has no foreign policy, only a domestic policy. I think that Henry Kissinger is probably right about the Arabs as well. We have no foreign policy. All we have is minilateral relations. You speak of Ashkenazis and Sephardis and Oriental Jews and Palestinians. Today we look at the region and we hear lessons about Druze and Alawites and Shia and Sunni as though we know nothing about our region. The fact is, that this is not multilateral, it is not bilateral, it's Byzantine politics. We all hide behind walls. A new architecture of relations is therefore called for, based around, again, I would suggest, one solution being the Helsinki process. I would commend to you the Blue Peace Report of the Strategic Foresight Group that reveals something known to the authorities but not to the public, that renewable freshwater resources in the mountain aquifer and the West Galilee aquifer have declined by 15 to 20 percent since last calculated by the Oslo process in 1993. The water level in the Dead Sea has fallen from 390 meters in the 60s to 420 meters below sea level in 2010. So I ask, is it not possible to put projects into a concept. Is it not possible to talk of a regional social charter to address that issue of making the law apply to everyone? Is it not possible to learn from certain Eastern European countries, and I address Karl Schwarzenberg among you, who was so instrumental in the years of the continuing conversation of the Prague Forum. We need to develop a concept of our shared future. It is time to engage with the Arab awakening and its winter offshoots, and indeed to engage with the ongoing discussion in all our countries as I watch and hear about the Israeli summer. I think I see Jacob Frankel among your participants. I hope that I can remind him about inviting us to New York one of these days to hold a conversation about the future of this region with independent figures like you and myself. But I want to say that these conversations are not going to lead us anywhere unless we find once again the will to progress together. My dear friend, Rabbi Dr. Albert Friedlander, and I conclude, often reflected on the following. Et 
את לטעת, ואת לעקור נטוע, את להרוג ואת לרפור, את לפרוץ ואת לבנות. קהלת 3.1.8. It is indeed a time to restore our faith, our joint faith, in this chain of humanity in each other. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.